The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I'm excited about uh, a lot of what we've got going on right now. We had Scissor Day on Tuesday, Brandon Day on Wednesday, and Strategy Day today. It's Thursday on Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Bespris, and the captain is in the house. He's brought with him a corner worth of strategy. Uh, Kurt, what's up, man? Welcome back. This isn't a crossover episode. This is actually just Fantasy NBA Today this time. Thanks, Dan. I'm excited to be here. Just living the dream. <laughs> I hope so. Um, so <laughs> you can, and I, I'm going to do this again. You haven't you haven't done me a favor by changing your Twitter, Twitter handle to something simpler yet, huh? I, I haven't. I, I might work on that, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm spelling it out for everybody. I am Dan Baspris, at Dan Baspris on Twitter. You can follow Kurt at capped, C-A-P-T, C-A-I-N, E-G-H-I-S. I'm not even going to pronounce it. it. Um, I'll let you do that. But uh, again, you can uh, find Kinegis. him on... Uh, what was that? It's Kanegis. Capped Kanegis. All right. But either way. Yeah. Uh, you can call him Kurt, but if you want to find him, you got to you gotta locate him on Twitter. Obviously, we'll tag him in everything we're doing here. Um, there, there's, there's something fun for me about being able to actually talk to other human beings this week. You're the third actual human i've spoken to on this podcast it's it's a magical time how uh before we even dive into the strategy stuff i wanted to take a second here to remind everybody um that we are still in the recruiting blitz at hoop ball i know yesterday i was talking about the rating and reviewing blitz but we are making a hard push right now for team coverage at hoop ball i know we've talked about this a few weeks back i wanted to bring it back into the spotlight if you'd like to cover a team either as a written beat writer or as a podcaster, holler at me. Dan Bespris on Twitter, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or send an email to teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Come cover a team. It's a hell of a day. It's a hell of a time. Um, all right, so, Kurt, I, I, I thought it might be fun because Tuesday we talked to Josh and we kind of got into the we we took three fringe guys and analyzed which ones were going to be rocks, which were paper, which were scissors. Yesterday with Brandon, we went into, generally it's buy low, sell high Wednesday, but this week it was buy low, sell high injury special Wednesday. I kind of wanted to go, because those shows are are uh, shorter lived in in some respect, because every week there's sort of a new... Uh, a new buy low, a new sell high, a new set of fringe guys to talk about. They don't last very long. I, I was hoping that you, Kurt, could kind of hit us with some evergreen stuff. I don't know what we're going to call it. Captain's Corner, Captain's Calm Collected Corner. But <laughs> just like strategic elements as we move our way through the season is something that I, I used to do more of on this podcast, and I kind of want to get back into it. Can you be that man for us? I'll sure give it a shot. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. We're eight weeks into the season. We probably should have done these shows sooner. That's on me. Um, and so we kind of have to skip over those a little bit. Actually, at some point down the line, Cap, I, I, I feel like we should actually go back and do kind of some retroactive strategy discussions of ways to approach the beginning of the season. But we're two months in now. We, we had our draft season. We had our crazy guys that pop up the first few weeks that nobody saw coming season. We had our first injury stretch. We've kind of settled now into the holiday stretch where there's not a ton of night-to-night turnover in terms of who you're looking at in the box score. People that are making moves right now are doing so largely because they have itchy trigger fingers on on fantasy side. Um, How do you, just as team construct, what are you looking for at this time of year? What is it that can stand out to you? I know that's a big, broad question, and we'll start from that and we'll kind of work in towards some of the details. Sure. So I play mostly nine cat head to head. And and when I say mostly, I guess that's <laughs> pretty much all of my leagues. But so I'm not the expert on points leagues, but let's see. I mean, I normally go into drafts with a mindset of drafting a balanced team, but there are certain guys that I would never steer away from like Andre Drummond. I'm never going to not draft him if he's there. And I, I go for that balanced approach and try to be pretty strong 
or as good as I can in all categories. And then if I wind up with kind of a, a soft punt, it's usually not on purpose. So as my season progresses and say I had somebody like a Zach Collins who I thought could maybe get me a, a block and a half and a three and a half, thinking that he was my, uh, I guess, my, my ringer for blocks if I needed them late in the draft, I picked up him. But then obviously, you know, things change as we go on. So now if I ended up with maybe one other guy on my team that's getting blocks, I might start to write that category off. Maybe see if there's a specialist out there that can kind of keep me above water, keep me competitive in that category. Otherwise, I might start to make some moves where I'm doing, uh, where I'm losing value on a trade, but it's really helping me be more competitive Ooh. in another category and not really costing me as much in the category I'm losing because I'd be losing it anyway. Interesting. Okay, so I have a number of follow-up questions on that. At what point during the year do you feel as though you have that kind of grasp on what your team is really strong or weak at? Is it is it now? Is it like, well, it sounds like it's already happened, but did it just happen or was that two, three weeks ago? How close are we right now to when you when you were able to settle in and say, okay, this is where I'm at? Um, it just kind of depends on, mostly on injuries. I have I have one league, well, actually I have multiple leagues where I have several guys out that were like key pieces for a while. So in those leagues, I'm not really quite sure what to expect. Um, I have one league that I look up and down the roster and I think it's great, but it is getting smashed night in and night out. It's 11th, <laughs> and I just barely climbed to 11th, and that's pretty rare. Like I'm usually at least in the top half, or at least competing to be in the top half. And that one, I might just have to throw it away. But never, never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still trying to make trades. Like you said, there's really not. We're past that stage where the hot free agents are all over the place. A different guy popping off every night, uh, minus Duncan Robinson. But <laughs> for the most part, yeah, we're probably moving to the mindset of, of trying to trade to fill some of those gaps. So you don't feel like it's at all. And, and listen, I'm not trying to lead you down any path. I, I'm legitimately curious on all of this stuff. I often make the, the turn that you're talking about uh, around the turn of the year. Not that it, you know, like a like a meta, like a leaf. I turn my <laughs> fantasy. No, it's not. It's not that kind of thing. I just I feel like there's a moment and I guess it's different for different folks where you mentioned sometimes you'll even trade down if it just makes more sense for your team. So you're already, by beginning of December, looking at those ROI trades, I like to call them, where you might not actually be getting the best player in the deal, but you're getting the best player for your team in the deal. Yeah, exactly. I might have somebody like a Hassan Whiteside who's getting you the 2.2 blocks, but if he's the only guy on my team that's going to block a shot... I mean, that's great, but I'm probably losing that category most weeks, so he loses a lot of his value in that regard. So it's, it, you, you called it a soft punt, which I, 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 I totally agree with. I, at times in the past, I've referred to it as, um, as the give up, because it's almost like <laughs> punting in my mind is always just, you know, you throw it on draft day, and then so this one, I think there's a lot to that, where if you're losing a category anyway... Or, and I'll convert this to a Roto discussion, if you're like second or third from the bottom in a particular category, you can give away one or two points there if you bring in somebody that can get you one or two points in two different categories, even if that person necessarily isn't ranked quite as high. So it there is a there is an innate value to it. What about here's talk here, I, I'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit for a moment. What if someone on your team got hurt now, meaning you made this trade, you got rid of the last guy on your team that could block shots, and you traded to, say, shore up a category that you were a little bit weak in? What if someone on that side gets hurt? Is that just something you sort of can't worry about when you're making a deal because any any injury could happen to anybody at any time? So, so like I traded away somebody kind of traded down like you said in total value and that guy I got back got hurt or even someone else on your team that you were counting on to be part of your your structure in these other categories it's kind of a dumb question I guess since it's all somewhat random no yeah if if, if it's not a super long injury if it's three or four weeks which you know is still painful 
um, I would hold on. And I would still kind of count that into my, my valuation on the team, um, especially in head-to-head. If I'm, like I said, okay in the standings or still in a reasonable spot where I could compete for the playoffs, I'll kind of keep that same valuation going and just kind of take my lumps for a few weeks. I have an additional devil's advocate question uh, on that same front. What about the... What about the this other notion? And this actually happened to me last year, so that's why I wanted to bring it up. I had gone into a soft punt in rebounds in one of my leagues, and and then uh, at right around two or three weeks before my head, this is the one head to head league I play in, by the way. About two weeks before the playoffs started, nope, I'm gonna get these numbers right. It was about six weeks actually before the playoffs started. I was able to pick up Jonas Valanciunas. Everybody dropped him last year because he was out for so damn long. I had, again, soft punted rebounds, but how could I leave that dude on the waiver wire? I ultimately ended up winning the league largely because I won rebounds and field goal percent because of Jonas Valanciunas. So isn't there... I know that you know that's probably more the exception than the norm, but isn't there a little bit of that fear that if you kind of lean into the soft punt too early guys that pop up on the wire that might normally be helpful, you, you, you kind of are inclined to leave them alone? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm a defensive special, like I, I love the defensive stats, those steals and blocks. And it seems to be almost every year, I don't know, February, March, there always seems to be this guy that pops up that is just getting you one and a half, two blocks a game and not really doing much else. And if you already had just the one shot block and you add him, he might be competitive there. Like, I don't know how many years ago it was, but back in the day, Rudy Gobert at a point was a waiver wire guy and he's averaging like four points, four boards and two blocks. And I, I picked him up and obviously lost value overall, but he ended up helping me win a league. Uh, there was, I don't know if you remember Larry Sanders. He did the same thing for me a few years ago. You know, last year it was Mitchell Robinson. So I'm always looking for that block specialist out there. So uh, then like it, I mean, you're talking about how you're kind of soft giving up on blocks right now. Do you, does that give you pause? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I don't normally try to, if I'm going to soft punt anything, I know I gave the white side example, but I will almost never soft punt on, on blocks or steals just because like ah, getting one or okay. two elite guys in that category is such a big difference maker. Uh, something, you know, like points or rebounds that everybody does or assist to a lesser extent, I guess threes this year, those are a little <laughs> harder. But with the blocks and steals, if you get you know your, your Chris Dunn off the waiver wire that's getting you close to two steals, or I don't know who it's going to be this year, somebody getting you close to two blocks, maybe, maybe it happens for a guy like Robert Williams down the road. But So you would advocate then if you're going to go into this soft punt strategy, don't do it in the categories where one guy can win you the category. Absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, kind of taking the, the corollary to the next logical junction point here on this discussion, this is the ROI time of year. Um, like, as for me, I said I, I tend to wait just a little bit longer than you do. What about how do people prepare themselves for what comes next? Or, you know what, forget that question. Let's go back into the ROI discussion for another, for another minute. How do you then engage fellow teammates in your league's in trade discussions, do do people feel like they're getting one over on you? Do people think that you're messing with them when you offer them the better player, or are you upfront with them? Do you just tell people, "Hey, look, I'm I'm soft punting, you know, points right now, so I don't have any use for T.J. Warren. I'm not selling you a Billy Goods here. Uh, this is the reason I'm getting off of him. I will take your worst player because he's helpful for my team." I I used to send my trade offers with a couple paragraph reasoning and how it helped the other guy and it didn't usually work. I kind of feel like maybe if you if you're pushing too hard to sell something, it just kind of raises some flags. Mm-hmm. So some sometimes like you said if you throw those offers out there where you're losing in total value but actually helping your team, that guy might look at it and be like, "Wow, is this guy crazy? Of course I'm going to accept that." So um, you just ba- basically operate in relative silence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I kind of want to try the other approach too, where I send it and say, Hey, you're probably winning this trade, but like you said, I'm, I'm punting this category. So this really helps me here and maybe try to actually help the other guy out in another category. 
I know that's probably controversial. You never want to really help the opposition, but sometimes you have to. Yeah, it depends on, you know, how much trust you have in your basketball team anyway. Um, okay, so what about waiver wire guys this time of year? What are you looking for in that department? Are you hunting for uh, are you hunting for stats the way that you're talking about with this with the trade ROI discussion? Or are you still hunting for sort of the best upside guy on the waiver. I'll tell you right now, for me, this is a time of year where I'm still hard hunting the best available player with very few small exceptions. Like I had a league where I could have picked up Chris Dunn, but I already have Kawhi Leonard, Jimmy Butler, and Chris Paul in that league. So the need for steals is not exactly in existence at all. I I ran the numbers and found out my team is averaging the highest steal rate of any team in the league. And so in that one instance, I passed up on a guy that I thought was better in favor of someone that I thought might be a tiny bit of a better fit. But, you know, nine times out of ten right now, I'm still hunting best player available. Have you already pivoted into the stat-dependent free agents, or does that come later for you? Uh, I think that comes later for me, usually. I'm With some of those teams, like I said, still trying to figure out what's going to happen with the injuries when they come back. The one team that is just really doing terrible, I think, is actually a good team, but I just want to see what it can do healthy. I'm probably in the same boat as you right now. I'm probably looking for best overall player but or somebody that kind of contributes across the board. But I am tempted, at least in a head-to-head league, to sometimes lean towards the guy who's just a potential freak in one category. So I, I picked up Davis Bertans. Oh uh, yeah, that one. Well, you kind of have to do that one. Yeah. Well, that was, that was, I think two weeks ago or so. And at that time I wasn't sure if he was going to keep it going and I'm just stoked that I have him. Um, and the other guy that I'm kind of, so I'll give you an a, example here that, um, you're probably not going to like this example cause it's uh, has to do with your spirit animal. Oh no, don't tell <laughs> What did you do to my poor Daniel house? So I, I haven't done anything yet, but I'm considering. So obviously he's a great player. I, I'm pretty sure he's still in the top 50 in non-cat. Well, doing well across the board, and I know still kind of coming back from an injury. But I have a league where I have him and Duncan Robinson sitting out there, and I know House is probably the smarter play. So I'm maybe you can talk me off the ledge here, but I'm really starting to maybe lean towards Robinson just because. Even though he doesn't contribute in those other categories, that elite three-point shooting can really make, for my team that's already pretty strong in threes, I think that would make it so that team wins threes just about every week, Hmm. unless things just go disastrously if if Harden hits a one of 16 from three-point land. What if you were, I mean, if you're telling somebody listening then, which direction would you tell them to go most of the time? Most of the time, that's probably, you probably want to go house. Okay. So you're still, most of the time, you're still hunting the guy with the upside. But it's, so the yeah. argument there, I, I'll, I mean, to in your defense, it's not like you were exchanging Daniel House for uh, Eric Gordon, who. <laughs> no, no. N- and not even, I'm not even talking about this year's Eric Gordon. I'm even, I'm talking about the last couple of years where even at his best, he's hitting a, a bunch of threes. But the reason Duncan Robinson has this upside is that his field goal percent isn't atrocious, and Eric Gordon simply hasn't been able to to make that claim. So, you know, you're you're looking at a guy who's also inside the top 100, and I feel like Robinson's been a top 80 guy for the last month. So, you know, it's not like you're exchanging House, who's like a top 60, for someone who's a you know top 115. You know, 60 for 80. 65 for 80, whatever you want to call it, that's not that big of a gap. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here, even though I obviously love Daniel House um, probably a bit too much. Um, Absolutely, me too. The The other thing that is it's very rare, at least in Yahoo leagues, that I like about Duncan Robinson, he can play three positions, well, I guess more than that, but shooting guard, small forward, and power forward. So it gives you a good amount of versatility with your roster on those days when you have a, a full lineup. Yahoo's great for um, player eligibility, by the way. It's the only damn site that actually says, you know what, everybody plays everything. Screw it. And like <laughs> every single dude has two or three different positions that they're playing these days. Uh, I have I have a big rant that I often do about player eligibility stuff in fantasy NBA because who cares what position d- dudes play these days, but I'll... I'll save that for another day. Um, one last thing for you. Um, 
and I don't. I actually didn't prep you for this one. I didn't give you the 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 ahead messaging that I was going to ask you this, but I feel like you can probably pluck something out of the sky. And that is this season. We'll try to we'll try to you know localize it to the the current NBA campaign. What's something that you've already learned from this season of play? Looking back, either on draft night or either a guy you missed or a guy you got or some way of analyzing something that maybe uh, was was new or different this year. Looking back, what's one of the hindsight notes that you think might be a good one to take away from this season? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I can even give one if you want me to buy you a minute here. Sure. <laughs> Let's okay. hear it. Um, so I let myself get talked into higher risk guys leading up to draft day. And everybody that listens to this podcast knows I, I preach safety, safety, safety at the top of your fantasy draft. Don't do something stupid in the first or second round because there's just no coming back from it. And then somehow, and obviously it's not like he's a bad basketball player, but somehow I ended up with multiple Kawhi Leonards. This was full on a case of me being talked into something that I wouldn't have normally done. I mean, people that listen to this show through uh, June, July, and August, they heard me say, I don't like it. He's going to play 65 games max. If he gets to 65, he could be a top 15 guy, but that feels like a ceiling for him. I know the per game stuff is great, uh, but my Roto Leagues have a games cap of 90 instead of 82, so you know it does impact you a little bit more when, when guys are missing extra ball games. I want to lean towards guys like... Bradley Beal, and even Jimmy Butler, who was moving into this alpha dog position. And and obviously, Dame, if you have a pick high enough, but as you get pushed down the charts a little bit, uh, looking at guys like Andre Drummond, Nikola Vucevic could have even come first. I don't know that those guys are all going to necessarily beat Kawhi at the end of the year, but all of these missed games and the contusions, it just makes it harder to get out to a quick start. And quick start is one of my other things that I preach on this podcast. So, uh, I feel like I, as I talked to a million different pros leading up to the season, I'm not going to pin it on anybody in particular, but I just feel like I slowly got talked into doing something I didn't want to do until it felt like a good idea in my head. And then I ended up with a guy that is, has been fine, but I mean, looking back, I, you know, I would have been happier taking Jimmy Butler in every one of those spots because they're right next to each other. Uh, Butler's played an extra ball game already, and that's even missing the first few uh, games of the year with the birth of his kid. So it's it's only going to get to be a farther separation between the two guys. So that is mine. Uh, stop letting so many cooks in my brain kitchen. What about you? <laughs> I I would say, and kind of along the lines of what you said, just trust your gut. If you've come into the season, if you, you've done your homework, you've been playing for a little bit, you've done your research – just trust your gut and try to meet somewhere in the middle. You're going to have those guys, like you said, that are way overhyped. And if you're like, I'm not really seeing that, like do your homework and see if you're missing something. But if you don't really see the jump, if you don't see a guy like this year, uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander was, I feel like getting a ton of hype. So and I know great. he was going to lead the offense in OKC, but people were saying he's a third round guy. And I just did not see that big a jump. I liked his defensive numbers. He had good efficiency. But now being one of the key cogs, you know, his efficiency has taken a huge hit this mm -hmm. year. So I saw people doing that in a, a few of my drafts. And I, I was excited to see that. Other guys, I think, I think you touched on him the other day. But Kyrie Irving going in the first round, I was nowhere near wanting to do that. Because he just, at least in head-to-head, -head, he just misses... I don't know, 15 to 20 games a year. And like you said, I like to play it safe in those first few rounds. I knew he was going to have a good year in Brooklyn. And after that first game, 50 points, I'm like, okay, maybe I was wrong here. But in so many places, I actually leaned more towards my gut than the hype. And, and like you've said before, Dan, if you go with all of the hype guys, you might hit on one of them. But all those other ones, they might be around two, three rounds lower in value than what the market's saying. Mm -hmm. If you just go safe, take your risks a little later on, then you're probably going to usually end up doing better overall. There are, what would, what would you say at this point? Of the hype guys, Luka Doncic obviously has been a great success in the hype department. That one's a big win for those that took a risk on him. Um, I think Kawhi's been kind of a wash at this point. 
would you, uh, you'd probably agree with that, right? I mean, he's missed a few games, but he's been good yeah. enough in the other ones. Um, I don't know if he's even a hype guy. That might be the wrong explanation. He's just sort of a risk guy. Uh, John Collins and DeAndre Ayton were both kind of hype guys this year, <laughs> and that was an unexpected twist that none of us saw coming. Um, looking up and down the charts a little bit, uh, another risk guy was Joel Embiid. He's obviously been a big letdown to this point. Uh, Bam Adebayo, he has these fantastic lines across the board, but has been tanking teams in free throws. So we can say whatever we want about him being, uh, you know, a couple clicks away from being that guy. But right now he's Ben Simmons, right? Like, I love his stat line. He's doing amazing stuff, but right now he's Ben Simmons, isn't he? That's like the yeah. same stat line. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe that's me being too harsh on him. I, I still think he's going to improve. Uh, Donovan Mitchell is a hype guy year after year. People were killing me because he got off to a top 20 start the first month. I think he's been in the 65, 70 range the last month. Uh, so that hype guy is sort of not really working out. And then you brought up Shea. I mean, he's he's nowhere to be found. He's number 104. Jaron Jackson is 103. Thomas Bryant was... Actually, Hoopball faded him. Bruski famously was down on Bryant this year. He was 67 before getting hurt. Um, you look at all these names that we're just pulling up here, and I'm sure there's more that I'm forgetting, uh, but all the guys that were that were getting pushed up the draft board, up and up and up and up and up, Luka Doncic is really the only one that truly hit to this point. And and what's crazy is, I mean, that's great if people are saying he's going to be have a good year. But you you can't really predict and say I knew his his percentages were both going to be way better than last year. Like that's something that you don't usually see, especially with increased volume. You don't usually see that. So. No, you don't. Uh, but here's the thing: like I'm going to give massive credit to anybody that did take that swing. There are a few guys that that you know put their put their nuts on the line, and that's cool. Um, but like for instance, Trey Young, he's basically right on his number despite having all of the usage in the universe. I've got to think that he probably takes a tiny bit of a hit. I don't think he's shooting 45% for the year, and you know his, his numbers are going to come down with Collins back. So he was another hype guy, and he's sort of right, right on his ADP. But the rest of those guys we just listed, you took, you took Jaron Jackson at 40, and he's sitting outside the top 100. You took Shea at 65. He's outside the top 100. These are picks that, that kill you. I just feel like every year I end up getting I, – I get talked into doing stuff I didn't intend to do. I don't know how this – I like, I, I'm supposed to be on this side of the fence, Kurt, and I, and I keep listening to – I think next year I'm just going to have no guests on the podcast for like two and a half months and just quietly sit in my room twiddling my thumbs and then make all the picks that I want to do uh, every year anyway. And that's just like get the guy that's going to play 75 games or more – uh, get the guy that's going to be within 10 spots of his ADP, either above or below, and quietly go about your business until round five, and then you can just do whatever the hell you want after that. Case closed. Like and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Captain's Corner, our first strategic podcast of the year. Kurt, thanks a bunch, man. No problem, Dan. Thanks for having me. That was fun. It was good. It's good to kind of argue a little bit about <clears throat> theory, fantasy theory. This is like the the fantasy class you'd take in undergrad, as opposed to <laughs> it's le it's less useful on the day to day. But it's a really good opportunity to kind of pull the camera back and look at everything from a broad view. Uh, you can follow Kurt on Twitter. I'm going to do it again with the spelling at cool. c a p t. C-A-I-N-E-G-H-I-S. I promise Kurt will tag you on everything so everybody can find you that way. He is the captain. The captain of the ship. And you got to go record a box score breakdown now, huh? Yes, sir. Congratulations on doing two consecutive hours of podcasts. It's fun. Thank you. <laughs> I like it. Cap, we'll talk to you in a week or two, yeah? All right, Dan. Thanks for having me. Kurt is just... He's just the best, man. He... He's a cool story, and I don't know. Maybe we should, you know what? Screw it. We'll tell the story right now. Um, Kurt started here at Hoopball as uh, a forum poster, just kind of interacting with us. And over time, he just developed into a an incredible fantasy mind. He was he was answering posts in the forum with these thoughtful, detailed replies. The type of stuff. I mean. This was way more thought than I was putting into stuff that I was writing in there. And I thought, geez, this guy, this dude should be a fantasy pro. And so here we are. 
Kurt, you got to follow him. I know it's a hard Twitter handle to find, so we'll we'll make sure to tag him and everything. But you you really got to give him a follow. Uh, I mentioned at the top of the show that we're we're on a team coverage recruiting blitz. That doesn't mean that the other stuff I always talk about every day is off the table. If you're loving the podcast, please do take that second to drop a five star review on the show. We need it. We love it. We love you. We need you. All of that stuff rolls together, uh, and it's just. It's a big deal. Every time we get a couple new reviews, it just it gives us a little more juice. When we put out a show, it reaches a few more people. When when someone searches for fantasy, we uh, we pop up a little bit more often. These things are all part of the weird iTunes algorithm. And so the, the longer we can hang out in that 4.9 to 5 range, the better, especially with, with more oomph behind it. So if you have iTunes... Or if you if your you know your work computer has iTunes, or if your buddy of yours has a computer with iTunes, or if anybody you know has an iPad or an iPhone, something with a podcast app on it, please do bring that bad boy up. Search for Fantasy NBA today. Again, regardless of how you're listening to this particular episode, search for Fantasy NBA today on iTunes or the podcast app. Click on the show title and then scroll to the bottom if it's on the app, or click on the rate and review tab if it's on iTunes and drop that five-star review on the show. If you want to write something nice, that's fine too. Uh, but honestly, the you know the reviews are you know, take 80 seconds probably, if that. Maybe two to three minutes if you write something. And uh, we'll love you forever. We'll just, you know, we'll keep churning out free content. So that's a big deal. Uh, the recruiting push continues to be a big deal. And then also the Bruise Letter, hoop-ball.com slash newsletter. Get on the Aaron Brewski weekly mailing list. Uh, it's fantastic, and now there are literally thousands of people on it. You should be too. Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday to go over. Although, funny thing is, there was almost more fantasy storyline happening in the four games on Tuesday than in the 11 games that happened on Wednesday. So we're going to rip through these bad boys at a pretty good clip. I I think we can be done in 45 to 50 minutes today. That's my goal. Set the timer. Let's do this thing. Lakers at Orlando. You see what I did there? I'm going into lightning round mode. Uh, low scoring affair, way under the projected total. A buck 83? Is that right? Yeesh. Uh, Anthony Davis was solid even in the, the clunky low scoring game. LeBron James triple doubled, but missed a bunch of free throws as per usual. Jared Dudley and Wes at one new got ejected in this game. So that's fun. Avery Bradley came back with a minutes cap, played 16 minutes. I'm actually only curious what that might do to Rajon Rondo. Alex Caruso played 28 minutes, not enough usage to get him fantasy value, but he's a big deal with this team, the stuff that he brings to the table. Uh, KCP was the only Laker besides LeBron and AD to do enough to get on the fantasy radar, but he's not a sustained effort. Uh, Orlando side, Jonathan Isaac, good to see him get the scoring back up. 19 points, 8 boards, 2 threes, a steal, and a couple of blocks. Aaron Gordon double-doubled in a somewhat efficient ball game. And then uh, the rest of the stuff was the usual. Evan Fournier scored a bunch of points. Sometimes it's efficient, sometimes it's not. Terrence Ross settling back into streamer mode. Lakers really, they clobber fantasy value right now. That, that's a team that you almost want to consider just benching guys against uh, I, I mean, kudos to Jonathan Isaac, by the way, for being a front court player that didn't get smothered by LeBron and AD, but it's it's a rough sled. Kawhi Leonard's return to Toronto was good for Kawhi. This one surprised me, by the way. I thought that uh, Toronto would come out and, and play with a little bonus fire, but it was really Pascal Siakam versus the world. OG Ananobi had a rough shooting game. Norman Powell was fine in his fill-in work. Kyle Lowry has not shot the ball well at all since coming back. And Marc Gasol, who... I had basically written off a week and a half ago, suddenly starting to play a tiny bit better. Nine points, 11 boards, six assists, three steals, a block. I think, what the hell did we talk about yesterday with Josh? We were, Josh basically was talking me off the ledge with Marcus Gasol, and he basically did so, to his credit, where I said, ah, fine, whatever. Like, there's just nothing on the offensive side. And he said, ah, he's been better. He's not going to shoot 32%. And I said, fine. Uh, and Josh is right. Josh is very right because he's not going to shoot 32% all year. Um, and the beauty of what happened here is that he he has been able to semi-float his value with other categories. So all it would take is basically like one or two 
buckets on any given night, and he becomes a useful fantasy player, and, and that's kind of what you saw here. So hopefully you guys didn't panic like I did for a couple of days there, and you held on just a little bit longer because uh, his last few lines have been uh, a little bit better. Kawhi Leonard will be sitting out the next one as part of a back-to-back. Uh, Pat Beverly took a shot to the dome in this game, had to leave with a concussion, so that just means even more Lou Williams. And uh, I don't know that you change the valuations all that much, even with both of those guys out. It's just going to be more for the usual guys on this Clippers team. Serge Ibaka only played 20 minutes again, although he's been sort of in that 20 to 22 range throughout the year. Um, I'm I'm going to stick with it, although it, it does seem like they like Gasol's defense so much that Ibaka gets pushed out to the periphery. He went 0 for 8 shooting in this game, had five boards, three assists, and two blocks. I mean, if he makes four of his eight shots and one of them three pointer, you're you know you're talking about an okay ball game, but not good. Uh, and he was already only sitting near the top 100, so he's now moving a little bit closer to the potential cut list. Houston at Cleveland. This was really James Harden all by himself. 55 points on 34 shots. He didn't need that many free throws in an unbelievable twist, but of course his massive ball game silenced a lot of his teammates. Ben McLemore slowed down. He had just six points in 33 minutes. P.J. Tucker kind of stayed above the fray with two threes, two steals, eight and five. That's the magic of being the perfect three and D guy. Uh, Daniel House played 26 minutes. He's still kind of working his way back from that bad illness. I'm He'll be fine. I'm not too worried about it. Still no Austin Rivers. And I, I wonder what that's going to do to Ben McLemore when he comes back. That's the only question mark. But this is one of those games where yeah, they scored 116 points, but it was really hard, and, and then everybody else got what they could. Of course, it ended up being a more efficient game for Russell Westbrook, so maybe that's a good thing. If you're looking to stream for three-pointers, Macklemore does seem to be a reasonable guy, but nah, I'm not, not really buying into it. Uh, Cleveland side, they got a good game out of Kevin Porter Jr. I think he goes by Jr., but I don't see it everywhere. 24 points, three steals, uh, six three-pointers. I mean, maybe there's some fantasy appeal there if you were to leap over some of the uh, crummy guys they they bother to run out there in the starting lineup every game. But until we see that a few times in a row, you're sticking with Larry Nance, Kevin Love, and Tristan Thompson. And even this one, Larry Nance was not very good. Boston lost at Indiana despite Kemba Walker's 44. Gordon Hayward broke his nose. For goodness sake, can we just catch a break for once? Uh, so I don't know what that's going to mean for him. Probably a game or two out. Hopefully that's it. Jalen Brown, solid. Jason Tatum didn't shoot the ball well. Uh, and then the battle for center minutes continues to be a messy one. But we shall see. We'll wait on that one. Uh, Indiana side, the um, it wasn't the five starters in this game, oddly. The starters were playing poorly, so Nate McMillan went to his bench a little bit more. Justin Holiday played 32 very good minutes. Aaron Holiday played 27 very good minutes. And that meant that Malcolm Brogdon didn't hit 30 minutes, although, I mean, he had 15 free throws and he made all of them, some of those down the stretch. Uh, TJ Warren, 29. Jeremy Lamb, only 23 minutes. Miles Turner, only 24. So there were just some guys that they didn't like the way they were playing. It was nice to see Miles Turner actually take 10 shots in this ballgame. That was a step in the right direction. He had a good first half. And then again, everybody got benched in the second half for a, a, a bench run. Uh, so Miles didn't see that many minutes post break and it slowed down what looked like was going to be an actually a decent ball game for him. So this is a weird one where, uh, you know, the usual guys were okay for Indiana, but they really went a little bit deeper than usual. Charlotte beat Brooklyn on the road. Uh, I don't know the Hornets are, are kind of staying in this thing a little bit. I mean, it's not like they're uh, ready to rumble, but they're only five games under five they They've won two in a row. Uh, and this was a nice win on the road against the Nets team that, by all accounts, should have been the better ball club. Devontae Graham had 40. Good Lord. Um, Cody Zeller, 10-6 and six off the bench. P.J. Washington played 37 minutes with Marvin Williams still out, but didn't really do much with them. Terry Rozier had one of those inefficient games that we were always kind of worried about, and then Miles Bridges is still sort of hanging around beyond the top 100. Uh, Devontae Graham, obviously, Terry Rozier, obviously, P.J. Washington probably buying himself some time with this number of minutes he's playing lately after dropping into the 20s for a little bit. I, I, I'm almost okay with the Miles Bridges drop. I, I know that that's almost sacrilege at this point, but I'm very close to it. He's number 136. He's been a little bit better lately, so I'm not going to panic on it. 
Um, let's call him a hold. I'm totally fine if you guys want to bench him. I think you probably just throw him out there and hope that it all levels off in the long run. That, that might be your best bet at this point. Uh, Brooklyn side, DeAndre Jordan was very good off the bench in this ball game. Jared Allen was very good as the starter, so the centers did their job. Spencer Dinwiddie had 24 points, so he was fine, but they just didn't get much else. Uh, you know, they, they need one other guy to contribute, and Torian Prince was particularly bad. So we'll, we'll shuttle along, not a whole lot to take away from this ball game. Atlanta on the back-to-back, they're just bad, man. They're really bad right now. If Trey Young doesn't play well, they get smoked pretty much any time that doesn't happen. I benched Kevin Herter, and I said it uh, on yesterday's pod and on Twitter because it was the back-to-back. I figured his minutes would be low. They got him into the mid-20s, but, you know, this was a get-your-legs-underneath-you kind of ball game. Jabari Parker, 11-7 and with a steal and a block. He was good enough in limited action in a blowout. Alex Len was actually very good off the bench. He's been solid lately, uh, although I'm, you know, I'm not trusting him, and, and John Collins is just a week and a half, two weeks away at this point. Bulls put up a buck 36, and they blew it out early, so the lines actually could have been even bigger. Zach Levine had 35 on only 16 shots. Larry Markinen had 22. Chris Dunn had three steals and a block. I mean, it's really, it's the, the, the connection is almost remarkable. Where they moved Chris Dunn into the starting lineup, and suddenly Larry Markinen started playing better. Dunn was in foul trouble in their last ball game, and that was Markinen's only not good game over this stretch. It's almost like a one-to-one correlation right now. You know, they moved Dunn into the starting lineup. When was that? I think that was in the Portland game. Was that it, right, on the road? Uh, he had 13 and 8 in that one. And then he's had 20, 15, 20, 22. Then he had 13 against Toronto's good defense with Dunn in foul trouble, and then back to 22 again against Atlanta. So marketing has been coming on. Hopefully you guys bought low. The Bulls playing a lot better with this starting lineup. Uh, they shared the ball well. They had 32 assists in this. I mean, the Hawks' defense obviously plays a role in, in why everybody had big numbers. Um, you're not buying into Kobe White. He has too many issues with his fantasy game. Wendell Carter Jr., yeah, you you, you rumble along right there. I think the good thing to, to note is that they, they mostly were healthy, uh, and Dunn still had his normal starting role. Thad Young actually got to play 33 minutes in this game. That was like a, hey, it's a blowout, have some fun, and he did. But uh, no real valuation changes. I I like Chris Dunn. I think he should be owned until he's not starting anymore because the defensive stats are going to be succulent. Utah got a big one from a number of guys, actually. Donovan Mitchell played well. Rudy Gobert played well. Joe Ingles streaming for Mike Conley played well. Minnesota defense played uh, the way they have been. Boyan Bogdanovich has been in a little bit of a funk, but he'll heat back up again. Minnesota side is actually the more interesting one of this ballgame. Jeff Teague, 36 bench minutes. 32 points, tried to keep him in it, couldn't do it himself. Cat uh, got stymied by Rudy Gobert, and Jared Culver, who we've detailed as kind of a luxury stash at this point, was particularly bad. Yikes, 2 for 8 shooting, 0 for 2 free throws. He is a guy you basically can't put in your lineup because he's going to kill you. He hurts more than he helps right now. I get the stash appeal, I do, uh, but it's it's... Too early to throw him in there, especially in Roto. He'll break you. Memphis got Brandon Clark back. He played 22 very effective minutes in this ballgame. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas was in foul trouble in the first quarter and then never really fully recovered to to kind of get himself into the mix. Dylan Brooks had 27 in one of his, his weird explosion games. Uh, John Morant was good. Jay Crowder was actually decent enough. And Jaron Jackson has been scoring a lot but uh, fouled out and only blocked one shot. So whatever. It is what it is. This game doesn't change my opinion on anybody. Hopefully you were able to get Brandon Clark while he was hurt, if you bought him or somebody dropped him. Kelly Oubre, 14-13, a steal and four blocks. He's having a great fantasy season. Ricky Rubio, 22-8, and eight, with a perfect 7-7 seven of seven at the free throw line. Devin Booker had one of his uh, rough ones shooting the ball. There are going to be a few of those, by the way. I don't mean to be you know, the the bearer of the pessimistic outlook on anything. But I don't know if you guys have noticed, but prior to this ball game, Devin Booker was shooting 51.5% on the year with a lot of those as jumpers. He's a great shooter. He's a great young basketball player, but ain't nobody shooting 51% with that number of shots away from the bucket. So there are going to be a few of these. 
he's actually a little bit of a sell high guy for me. I like the efficiency we've seen so far this year, but I am not a believer that that number can hold throughout the rest of the season. Mikael Bridges was a guy we were watching. He played 21 minutes and didn't do anything with it, so I think you can safely leave him on the wire. Dario Saric, uh, with Frank Kaminsky logging a bunch of extra minutes at center, and Aaron Baines playing 18 center minutes off the bench. Saric getting pushed farther away from the bucket. Seven points, five boards, five assists. I like the passing, uh, but you're going to see those rebound numbers come down, and that's going to be uh, a kick in the groin for him. New Orleans got blown out by Milwaukee. J.J. Redick woke up, so that was good at least. I think I had him on my bench for this ball game, so you're welcome if, uh, if you didn't. The reason he, of course, went crazy was because, uh, obviously, because I did. Uh, no Giannis on the Milwaukee side. I actually considered betting on Milwaukee in this game. I, I love when a team's missing a superstar in this rest type of format because they know they're going to wax the team anyway. Eric Bledsoe picked up the pieces with no Giannis. Milton actually was not that great in this ballgame. Ersan Ilyasova was the one-to-one flip, and he had a really nice fantasy game. But that'll all go back to the uh, normal stuff for Milwaukee. The Sacramento Marvin Bagley return game was an interesting one for uh, one key reason, and that is Rashawn Holmes got a, picked up two fouls in like the first four minutes of this game, and the first half was largely uh, a clunko for him. So the fact that he was even able to make this a serviceable fantasy game was actually a positive. And I will go one step farther and say, if that foul trouble had not been an issue, in all likelihood, it would have been Bielica that would have suffered from Bagley's return. So as it turned out, they were able to sort of mix and match guys and just play a truckload of forwards and wings and and Corey Joseph. <laughs> Uh, and and kind of piecemeal this thing together. Uh, I have no fear at all for Rashawn Holmes going forward. I mean, this to me will probably be one of his worst games uh, in the next couple of weeks because of the foul trouble. Um, I, I think, and Jonas Nader made a great point on, on the Real Big Three podcast with uh, myself and Bogman, that if somebody were to be a little worried maybe that, that Holmes is going to lose some of his value, might see this game and think, oh, no and not know the entire story, this is a great time to float some top 75, top 80 type guys out uh, for the guy that has Rashawn and see if you can pry him away from somebody that thinks he's going to take a nosedive. Uh, otherwise, Marvin Bagley, obviously, you know, you start to roll him out there now as he gets his legs underneath him. You can hold on Bielitsa uh, if you want at this point, uh, but he, we saw it last year, he's going to trend down Um Harrison Barnes, for whatever reason, had a cold game, but it's going to be Bielitsa that, that ends up trending down. You know, Barnes, they gave a ton of money to, so he'll get his time. Bagley is the future. Holmes has been their guy that's held the team together with everybody hurt. Um, Nemanja is going to be the the fellow that ends up taking the hit here. So uh, you'll probably see him end up on waiver wires if you want to try to chuck him out there until Bagley's back uh, completely up to speed. That's fine. You can, you can roll the dice there a little bit. Problem is you're probably going to get caught with your pants down the day that he really does fall off a cliff, and I'm not sure that I'm willing to risk the uh, the pantsless Bielitsa moment here on my <laughs> on my fantasy team. Um, Danilo Gallinari came back quickly from an injury and a very weird twist, and uh, everything else has been the same with uh, Oklahoma City over the last little bit. Steven Adams has been better. That's cost Nerlens Noel some of his playing time. He's back down into that 18, 19 minute range instead of 2021, and that is a difference maker. But he's still a must start guy because his percentage, particularly field goal percent, is very good, and he can rack up defensive stats very fast. But Steven Adams has been playing better lately. Chris Paul has been orchestrating like crazy, and so they are competitive literally every night these days. The Thunder, by the way, you guys might not know this, are in the playoffs right now, if you can believe that. I know. People are like, well, they're going to blow it up. It's time to blow it up. Uh, Thunder, right there, man. Uh, the West has six very good teams, and then one, two, three, four, five, six teams that are probably all going to fight for the last two spots. The East is interesting because the East really just has, uh, I would argue, also six good teams. But then the final two spots, it's probably just going to be three teams battling it out for those final two spots. And the, the Nets, the Magic, the Pistons, I honestly could probably put the Nets in and just say already we know that it's just going to be the Magic and the Pistons fighting for that eight seed. 
But uh, who knows? Maybe the Hornets or the Bulls get hot. Probably not. Who am I kidding? Almost definitely not. Yeah, let's get uh, let's get a grip on ourselves here. Um, so you know that's that to me is the story here is that you know you're dealing with a, a foul trouble game. You might be able to get Rashawn Holmes. That's got to be the big story from this one. The last one on the docket, of course, the Knicks going into Golden State, a game that it looked like New York had well in hand for most of the ball game. Warriors came back and sent it to overtime. And, of course, that gave us a few extra things to to discuss on this podcast. Uh, when it looked like this one was going to be a fairly ugly regulation game, I had kind of written up some stuff, and then I had to go back and, and make some adjustments to it. Uh, number one, well, let's start with the Warriors side. They're making me look smart right now because what you're getting is, and, and obviously with overtime, everybody gets a little bit of a boost, but in regulation, the only two guys that really had useful fantasy lines with a slight nod to Marquise Chris, who who came off the bench and did a couple of good things, were Draymond Green and D'Angelo Russell, kind of the guys that you would have expected in an overtime or a, a regulation contest with a bad Knicks team. And this just feeds into what we've been talking about. First, it's nice to see Draymond actually getting his minutes ramped up a little bit. And second, we talked about this stretch of games between December 1st, effectively, this month, and the one back-to-back they have at the end of the month. Ten games in a row without a back-to-back. And then they have another stretch after that without a back-to-back for a while. The reason that you don't necessarily wait all the way through the non-back-to-back spell is that if any little hangnail pops up, you might see either or both of these guys get sat for a while again. They might just sit them down, and then you're stuck with the same issue you had before. The reason I like trying to move them during this 10-game stretch is that right now they're healthy. I feel like this is a reasonable number of games to play in a row for these guys without a weird little injury or rest day popping up. And you're probably at a point where... If you're in a league of people that are not listening to this podcast or following me on Twitter where I've been crowing about this stretch of games, you might be able to take D'Angelo Russell in there and say, look at this dude got 32-6. and six. You know, he's a top 40 guy. Waboom, waboom, waboom. Take him off my hands, and I'll even do you this favor. I'll take a top 65 guy off your hands. They feel like they're making out like bandits. They get a month and a half of D'Angelo Russell before the whole thing comes apart. You're out from under it. Same deal Draymond Green. Triple-doubled with four steals last night. That's a really good fantasy line, one of the better ones on the night. If he does this, and it doesn't have to be this good each time, but if he does some reasonable facsimile of this another one or two times over this stretch of non-back-to-backs, same kind of thing. Hey, man, Draymond Green, he's putting up triple-doubles now. Uh, he, you know, We're past the rest stuff from the beginning of the year. This is your sales pitch to somebody. Look, he's playing even if you and I don't really believe that it's going to stick through. I mean, I, I think we both feel, all of us likely feel, that he's going to sit the back-to-back, almost for sure. And then once you get into the long stretch of games in the dog days, in January, February, All-Star break, whatever, you're going to see more rest days and little injuries crop up. This is our window, and you just have to sell it to someone as, look, they're fine now, they're terrible Yeah, they're a shutdown risk, so you're not going to be able to sell them at a profit. But at least, and if you're in a Roto League, you can make the case that that's not going to come until towards the end of the year, even if I think we all agree there's probably going to be some little stuff in between now and then. You at least have a sales pitch. So go float some things out there. You're probably not going to get a one-to-one type deal, but you know, use Draymond Green as a little bit of a kicker piece right now. Try to turn a a top 50 guy on your team into a top 30 guy by adding Draymond Green into the mix. Little stuff like that. Get Turn these guys into some sort of benefit for your team before the wheels come off. Uh, Willie Cauley-Stein, I think, is probably a hold. He's been decent enough most games. Kevon Looney is definitely a drop. They have no intention of playing him decent-sized minutes and risking injury. He's, you know, he's playing five to 10 minutes a game. It's just, it's not happening. It was worth a shot. We picked him up. We stashed him for a week and uh, they're not, it's just not happening. Alec Burks is hanging out right on the rim. But again, when things turn sour, they turn sour real fast for a guy that basically only scores for your fantasy team. So you guys know how I feel about uh, most of the fringy guys on this roster. The Knicks side, we had no clarity at all at the end of the third quarter and got a little bit through the fourth and overtime. One, we'll just start on the easy stuff. Mitchell Robinson's a buy low. 
Uh, he played almost 30 minutes in this game, nine points, nine boards, three blocked shots. That number could even be higher. The block rate is down a tiny bit this year. Uh, he'll he'll cruise back into decent value. I mean, he's not going to be the top 30 guy that folks wanted, and it's it's kind of why we said you had to dodge him unless he fell like an extra round or two. As it turns out, he needed to fall like three or four rounds, but we're not at that point yet. Uh, his his owner is probably getting a little bit more excited here with a couple of decent ones mixed in. I don't know what it's going to take to pry him off of somebody's hands, but I would I would throw some top 85 guys out there. Somebody ranked between like 78 and 86, see if that gets it done, because I think he's going to steamroll past that point. Marcus Morris, he still has the, the green light, which I guess is good. So far, the coaching change hasn't ruined what's been a uh, wildly successful Marcus Morris season so far, which uh, he's number 52 in nine cat. So hopefully that'll just continue to float right along. RJ Barrett played a ton in yesterday's blog game, blog 46 minutes. So even that ridiculous thing that they were doing with him hasn't changed much. He managed to dodge the stuff that's been killing him and, you know, this is a guy that was actually getting dropped in some leagues, and I actually think there's a very reasonable explanation for his droppage. He's still number 283, even after this massive ball game, because he's shooting a high volume 39% from the field and a medium volume 55% at the free throw line. That stuff matters. If you wipe that off the board, yeah, obviously he's been useful. And in this one, he happened to shoot, you know, 50% from the field and 75 at the free throw line, but that has not been the norm. You do not want to go get this dude. Uh, he's going to kill your fantasy team. And I, I don't know that he, there's going to be a big turnaround towards the end of the year because the offense for the Knicks is just is stupid. Julius Randle was serviceable. No steals, no blocks, four turnovers. So he still hurt you in three categories. And he only kind of hurt you in the other two, uh, shooting 7 out of 16 from the field and 7 out of 10 from the free throw line. So he didn't crush you in those departments. And 24 points and 13 rebounds, 5 assists, 3 pointers is fine. If he did this every game, you'd be sitting on a guy hovering sort of near the edge of the top 100 because of the shortcomings. The problem is that this is the easiest matchup he'll probably have all season long. The Warriors are guarding nobody, and still he couldn't shoot over 50% in a ball game. I mean, it's just crazy. It's why he's glued to my bench right now. I know you're looking at it, you're like, Dan, you missed out on 24 and 13. I'm like, yeah, but I don't care, you know? Th th this is one of the, the fun things about uh, credit to the Basketball Monster box score page. It, it, you can sort it based on your league settings and it'll organize an entire night's worth of games. The guys by how they compared to other players on that same evening, Julius Randle uh, on a day where about uh, 250 players got into basketball games. I think it was like 220 something or 230. He was number one Oh two. Despite the big popcorn numbers, there is so much more. He did four categories out of nine and he was bad. He was anywhere from from meh to terrible in the other five. That is not nothing. It's not nothing. Turnovers, free throw percent, field goal percent, steals, blocks, all of that was a negative. Five negatives do not outweigh four positives. I can do that simple math. So he's still glued to my bench. I, I need to see a significant turnaround before I do anything there. And finally, uh, the point guard spot. We had no clarity at all at halftime. At halftime, I think Franklin Lakina had played like eight minutes and Alfred Payton had played like six minutes and then someone else. I think R.J. Barrett slid down and played some point guard. Uh, and then Alfred Payton basically played the entire fourth and overtime. So suddenly he went from playing like 12 or 13 minutes to almost 30. 14, 4, and 5 with a steal. Five turnovers. Uh, he's not going to hit a ton of three-pointers, which I, I suppose is fine. Um but this was encouraging because he was part of the unit that kept them from blowing the game. So you probably want to put him on a roster. The 30 minutes was a big deal. I don't know what's going to happen in the next one. He could easily get outplayed by Nilakina on a night-to-night -night basis, and then it shifts back. But in terms of... And it's not even an upside play. I don't think either of those guys has much in the way of upside. But starting point guard jobs don't grow on trees. Starting point guard jobs where you're the only person on a team that really focuses it all on passing, that also doesn't grow on trees. And so if you can find a guy that's 
might get you four to six assists per ball game, you, you sort of float something out there, and hopefully he can buoy his numbers with some steals and try to keep those turnovers down a little bit. Because there are going to be some issues with this game. There always are. Uh, low three-pointers, usually high turnovers, not a ton of scoring, little stuff like that. But if he gets sort of cut loose with this god-awful team, then there's you know there's something to be said there. So if, if he was dropped, you probably pick him up, you stash him, see how it goes. I am not starting him in my next ball game, uh, but I'll keep an eye on it. Your Thursday card. We got a quickie here on Thursday. Uh, four games, Philly at Boston. Gordon Hayward is probable, so I think you can probably start him and just assume his nose is okay-ish. Uh, Philly is fairly straightforward. I think you'll see Josh Richardson kind of slowly ramp his minutes up here. Cleveland-San Antonio in what should be a very awful fantasy game. Spurs have been off forever, so presumably everybody on that club is healthy. We'll just keep one eye on the point guard job. Cleveland, uh, Kevin Porter Jr. actually, I mean, we talked about he played well in their Wednesday evening games. We'll see if that buys him any extra run or if it's back to the same old garbage. Dallas, I don't feel like they've played in a while either. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the Tim Hardaway Jr. stuff going uh, around out there. DeLon Wright, I believe, is questionable for this game, so I wouldn't lean into that one too hard. And, uh, yeah, not a, not a ton else going on with that roster. Detroit, Everybody expected to play, so you kind of know what you're getting there. Portland, we're watching Kent Bazemore. This should be another tough one, actually, against Denver. The last one, he didn't get to do much because of a blowout. This one, there's just going to be good defense all the way around. Uh, we'll see how Mello fares against Paul Millsap and Jeremy Grant, and uh, we'll see if Nikola Jokic has the level of aggression that we actually want out of him. Turned into a longer podcast. I was wrong. I apologize for that, but hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Big thank you, as always, to the captain taking us into a nice, deep, strategic discussion. Had a lot of fun there. Again, just, you know, look for the, the tweet we send out. That's how you can find him. His Twitter handle's tough right now. I'm at Dan Baspris. Hit me up if you want to be a contributor. Rate and review. All that good stuff. You know the drill. Sign up for the Bruise Letter. Blah, blah, blah. We repeat, we repeat, we repeat. Hopefully you guys are doing it. Have a wonderful Thursday. We'll wrap it up tomorrow with the weekend review, the weekend in preview, and of course, a little Thursday card review as well. I'm Dan Vespers. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.